Hi, this is a podcast from the Physician-Patient Alliance for Health and Safety. The podcast that we're presenting today is called Avoiding Respiratory Depression in Patients During Conscious Sedation. Welcome to our podcast. My name is Pat Iyer. I'm a nurse, and this program is generously supported by Medtronic and EarlySense. As a global leader in medical technology, services, and solutions, Medtronic improves the health and lives of millions of people every year. Medtronic believes its deep clinical, therapeutic, and economic expertise can help address the complex challenges such as rising costs, aging populations, and the burden of chronic disease faced by families and healthcare systems today. But Medtronic can't do it alone. That's why Medtronic is committed to partnering in new ways and developing powerful solutions that deliver better patient outcomes. Our second sponsor is EarlySense. They deliver continuous monitoring solutions designed to enhance proactive patient care for non-ICU general care patients. The EarlySense system provides continuous and contact-free monitoring of heart rate, respiratory rate, and motion for early detection of patient deterioration, fall prevention, and pressure ulcer prevention. I have with me Rick Kenny, who is a respiratory care practitioner. Rick, could you please tell our listeners about your background and where you're working? Yes, I would. Thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, I am a respiratory therapist and have been uh, for the past 30 years. I currently work in um, a facility in Los Angeles, uh, White Memorial Medical Center, and uh, have been with that organization for the past three years. Terrific. Our topic today is respiratory depression, and with a particular focus on people who are at risk during conscious sedation. We know that patients are often given opioids and other medications to reduce awareness during painful procedures. Why should we be concerned about the risk of respiratory depression even during conscious sedation? Uh, That's a good question. Uh, We know that patients react differently to medications. Some react lightly and some have uh, some pretty severe reactions to it. Uh, Opioids at certain uh, dosages can lead to uh, respiratory depression, as we know. If too depressed, the risk of respiratory failure can occur jeopardizing the patient's health. Um, If it goes unnoticed by those monitoring that patient, for example, uh, the patient may appear to be okay uh, at a simple glance, but at a time uh, the the respiratory rate drops, uh, we're now faced with a compromised patient. So it's important that we pay particular attention to those patients receiving opioids. I know that the traditional way of monitoring patients in the past has been to use pulse oximeters to detect respiratory depression. Isn't it sufficient to use them? No, it's not. Pulse oximetry is only designed to detect oxygen saturation and heart rate, not the ventilatory status of a patient. Uh, Big concern is by the time the saturations drop and the alarms are uh, alarming, you've gotten beyond that threshold of the patient uh, having a quick recovery of that. Um, I've always been and will always state that one should never rely on the use of of pulse oximetry as its only means of monitoring a patient's condition. Remembering that monitors are only a tool to use, but the real monitoring is looking at the patient to see if the readings that you're looking at match the patient's condition. And has your hospital decided to address this with different technology? Yes, we have. Uh, As you know, the the Joint Commission has made recommendations to include entitled CO2 monitoring uh, during conscious sedation procedures. Uh, We use uh, CO2 monitoring in the OR during cases, uh, so why not use that at the same time uh, during the conscious sedation procedure? As stated earlier, patients react different to sedatives. I have a family member who is very sensitive to medications, and what would be a standard dosage to a normal patient, uh, this family member overly reacts to it. And then on the other side, I have another family member who could take the dose of, that would knock a charging vinyl down, and it doesn't affect them at all. So it's really important that we have uh, that additional tool, entitled field 2 monitoring, uh, to have that extra safety net for the patient. And is there another term for entitled CO2 monitoring? Uh, well, we call it ETCO2 monitoring. Okay. That's the abbreviation. 
Okay. Tell us about when your hospital is using this now. You mentioned in the operating room, but where else will it be used or is it being used? We are uh, in the process of implementing it anywhere that conscious sedation is used. Right now we're using uh, it in um, most procedures uh, such as bronchoscopies, uh, GI procedures. Uh, that We have uh, a very large increase in the number of GI cases that we're doing, uh, and so we're having to supply additional equipment to those areas to monitor uh, the safety of those patients. It's also used in the uh, cardiac suite where they do the uh, transesophageal echograms. We want to put those patients in a very relaxed state, uh, but not put them out completely. In other areas, we're using it in patients that have a very difficult time trying to go into an MRI scanner. So we have uh, anesthesia that comes in, and they help uh, put those patients at a very relaxed state while closely monitoring them. Uh, and entitled CO2 or ETCO2 is, is part of that uh, monitoring. Okay, I understand. I'd like to switch the focus for just a minute on patient-controlled analgesia pumps because there is a common misperception that I've heard specifically from nurses that if the patient controls the frequency of the doses and the pump is programmed to limit the number of doses, it's not possible for the patient to receive too much medication. I know that this is an area that you have also looked at. Could you tell us why it's that statement is not true? Definitely. Uh, again, going back to the earlier statement, uh, that what affects one patient uh, one way can dramatically affect the, another patient uh, with that same dosage. Uh, in my last few years of my career, uh, with the introduction of the PCA pump and the ability to be able to uh, self-dose uh, with the same pump, we've received a lot of rapid response calls uh, to the changing condition of a patient. Uh, it, that's very concerning. And so our organization uh, has uh, provided us with a device, uh, an entitled CO2 monitoring device that attaches to uh, the PCA pump, uh, the patient-controlled analgesic device. Uh, that has, is set up by respiratory care and is monitored by both the nurse and the respiratory therapist. If a patient reaches the preset parameters that we've uh, set that patient to based off their, uh, their normal physiological condition, uh, case in point would be like a patient suffering from chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, we want to set those alarms so that we're not getting a lot of nuisance alarms on those. Uh, but this end tidal CO2 device when those parameters are reached that is indicating that the patient is uh, overly sedated, it will pause that uh, pain control pump and it cannot be, reactiv be reactivated until uh, a nurse or a respiratory therapist has gone to the patient's bedside and has physically evaluated that patient to make sure that they are awake and responsive and are able to answer uh, questions appropriately. If the alarm goes off uh, one time, and it self-corrects, then the device has done its job because the alarm is loud enough not only for us to be able to hear it out in the hallway or in another patient's room, but it startles the patient to wake up. And if the patient starts breathing again, uh, that alarm is still sounding, uh, but it's done its job. So the nurse or the respiratory therapist, when they come in, uh, they visually inspect that patient, they reset the pump to allow it to go back on and start delivering that again, and they're with that patient for up to 15, 20 minutes to make sure that they are literally awake enough to be able to uh, handle the dosage. If they fall back to sleep a second time and it alarms, then it is the responsibility of the nurse and the respiratory therapist to get a hold of the physician to have that uh, dosage reduced, thus protecting the patient from any harm. You know, that's a wonderful combination of technology. I'm aware of several cases of people who have been over-sedated by uh, patient-controlled analgesia pumps without having the end tidal CO2 monitor in place. And unfortunately, nurses have discovered them in a state where they are almost beyond being able to save their lives. And in some cases, the patients uh, died as a result of that over-sedation. So 
I'm real impressed with the safety aspect of what you've just described. Yes, I am too. It's, it, it's, I will be totally honest in that since the implementation of this uh, combination of uh, monitoring the patient, the number of rapid responses to those areas where uh, the patient comes out with that PCA pump uh, have, I want to say, better than 50% reduction in calls. Mm -hmm. uh, for rapid responses. So I'm very impressed with that. And we hope that as we go through, and uh, now this is relatively new to our hospital, uh, it's been uh, in place for about six months, and in that time we you know, are constantly educating and re-educating uh, staff on, on the device and the need for the uh, cannula, which is the uh, device attached to the patient, to remind the patient and to re-educate the patient that, uh, and the family members as well that it needs to stay in place. Yeah, so it works, it's done its job. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about the use of oxygen during conscious sedation. I think some people might be under the impression that if the patient is receiving oxygen during conscious sedation and has a respiratory rate that's reduced, that the oxygen would prevent respiratory depression. Is that true or not true? Uh, that is not true. Uh, oxygen in no way uh, stimulates the respiratory uh, system to uh, breathe. That is uh, just a monitoring device to sit there and say, yeah, you know, I've got enough oxygen in me, I'm, I'm doing good. But the reality of it, of it is, is uh, if I can use an example, you take a, a patient uh, and they're on a two-liter nasal cannula, we consider that to be a uh, FiO2 or a fraction of inspired oxygen uh, to be around 28% roughly. If you take a patient and you put them on uh, conscious sedation or a PCA pump uh, and they're sedating themselves uh, too much, then the anatomical dead space, meaning the upper airway and the trachea and that, becomes a, a reservoir where the oxygen keeps building up and building up and building up. And so that concentration goes from 28% and keeps climbing and it can go as high as 60%. So when that patient takes in that deep breath, they get all of a sudden that bolus of oxygen, their saturations rise. And so that kind of gives that false, you know, if you're looking at just using that pulse oximetry only, uh, oh, hey, my patient's doing really good. I don't have to worry about it until such time that their respiratory rate has dropped so severely that the oxygen is not getting into their system, and at that time you've reached that, uh, you've gone beyond the threshold of being able to bring that patient back safely. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and so, uh, the, I'm sorry, the uh, CO2 concentration is what stimulates the body to breathe. And so that's why uh, we don't want to sedate so much that it knocks out the, the, that drive of the human body to respond. Mm hmm and why giving oxygen to somebody with COPD is such a, um, a hazardous situation if the oxygen levels are too high because it's knocking out the CO2 drive. Correct. Uh, and glad that you brought that up. Exactly. Uh, and tidal, uh, I'm sorry, I keep saying entitled CO2. The um, CO2 buildup in a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease patient uh, is for so long that eventually the body gets, you know, tired of trying to fight that battle. So it reverts to what uh, we term as uh, hypoxic drive. And you're absolutely right. The body is uh, looking at the oxygen uh, levels in the bloodstream and sits there and if it climbs up too high, it tells the, the COPD body that, hey, I'm doing fine, go ahead and rest. And then we just make a situation that's bad even worse. Mm -hmm. I know that your hospital has taken the initiative to address the risks associated with conscious sedation. Could you tell us why your staff has focused on this problem and what you've done about it? Uh, exactly. Um, well, actually, I would like to say that it's more of a uh, organization uh, process. Uh, I belong to an organization that has uh, several hospitals in it. And mm -hmm. up in our corporate office, um, they were listening to our teams at all the different facilities saying, hey, you know, we've got a problem here. And so they took the initiative to work with a vendor uh, to bring in uh, to all hospitals uh, a certain number of entitled CO2 monitoring with the capability of monitoring uh, oxygen uh, levels at the same time. And with that initiative, 
uh, they're furthering that by coming up with a corporate policy on how this should be handled. Uh, and the teams have, um, we have more than enough team members that, uh, to make this happen and make it happen quickly. Okay. And what are you doing about that specific problem as a team? Uh, what we're doing is that, uh, as you know, nurses are really kind of being inundated with so many things uh, today with uh, electronic documentation and so on and so forth. But the respiratory therapists uh, want to do their part. So we've made an agreement with the nursing uh, group that respiratory therapy will be 100% responsible for uh, the application and monitoring of the entitled CO2 uh, devices. And we will take and round on those patients uh, every four hours as the nurses round uh, every four hours as well so that it, the patient is basically being seen every two hours and that respiratory will be responsible for the documentation uh, in the electronic medical record of that rounding. And, that, and at the same time, uh, both the nurses and the respiratory therapists are there to educate the, the patient and the family um, on the cautions and precautions of uh, using uh, the pain pumps. Mm-hmm. I know we've just talked about the alarms associated with the patient-controlled analgesia pumps, and we know that if you walk into any hospital, you'll hear pumps, IV pumps alarming, ventilators, cardiac monitors, other types of equipment alarming. I think it can get overwhelming for the staff and for visitors and for patients. I'd like to know your perspective on the term alarm fatigue. What does that mean for you? Uh, good question. Uh, alarm fatigue is literally, I, I've been, again, in respiratory for about 32 years, and in that time, uh, you hear alarms go off constantly. The heart monitors, uh, pulse oximetry, when when that came into standard of care, uh, now the inclusion of the IV pumps, and then you have uh, the uh, alarms that go off on uh, different uh, devices, uh, other than those mentioned. And so it, it's a constant barrage of sound. And like anything that you hear constantly over time, you become deaf to it, if you will. And so um, in that case, the alarm fatigue that happens with that is basically nuisance alarms. They're just the devices were not set uh, to alarm uh, for that particular patient. They just set it at its default setting. Uh, patients move, patients scratch, patients take and uh, pull on things, uh, and so whenever any of those things occur, uh, those machines are not able to detect the condition of the patient, and so it's been programmed to alarm. And when you have several patients on a floor and they're all on one device or another with the alarms attached to them, it's just a constant barrage. And note that we, are, we train ourselves to hear for specific sounds of alarms, uh, because the manufacturers learned over time you cannot have one alarm sound for every condition. So for us, uh, our ventilators have three separate alarms, and when we hear that one specific alarm, we know that we drop whatever we're doing to go find out what's going on with that. Uh, but that can't be said for all, all devices. Uh, the alarms are, like I said, if, if you go to a patient goes to scratch, uh, the heart monitor picks that up. It doesn't know what to do with it, so it, it alarms. It self-corrects in most cases, but in other times, if a patient pulls on the oximetry probe or pulls on the uh, electrodes uh, attached for the EKG monitor, uh, the alarms constantly go and go and go and go, and uh, people just become numb to those sounds. Mm -hmm. And then tying that to respiratory depression, how does that alarm fatigue affect that risk? Uh, on the pulse oximetry uh, in particular, uh, when it comes to uh, the respiratory depression, uh, we get that alarm doesn't have any different sound to whether the patient pulled the probe off, or the patient's moving, or the patient's literally having having an issue. You take and you have a ward with say 20 rooms on it, and there's uh, 20 devices going at the same time with the, the pulse oximetry. You get so used to hearing those that you don't respond until you realize that that alarm is not silencing itself, 
but at that time you could have gotten beyond that that threshold point of bringing, mm -hmm. being able to bring that patient back safely. I know that the term alarm fatigue is of concern to the healthcare providers. It's con it's of concern to the people who are making the equipment. And there are several efforts to try to address this from different perspectives, including how the manufacturers are adjusting those alarms or adjusting the sensitivity. But what can we share with healthcare staff about what they can do about the risks of alarm fatigue? That's a good question. You know, uh, right now it's become such an issue, is you know that uh, the Joint Commission has now made it one of the national patient safety goals is to address alarm fatigue. Uh, our organization at our corporate office uh, realizes that this is a big problem and has mandated uh, each hospital find out what the concerns are uh, at the staff level and also find uh, a way to be able to help uh, minimize those alarms. So a policy is, is in the works of being developed uh, that makes uh, certain rules uh, that we have to follow in order to make sure that uh, alarm fatigue uh, becomes a thing of the past if there is such a uh, place. Uh, and we're going around and we're talking to staff as part of that policy to make sure that the alarms are being set appropriately. Um, we found that patients that are put on devices, they're just put on them and staff is just relying on the uh, default settings for every patient. And we know that all patients are different. And another point is, is that you have to take and constantly educate the patient and the patient's family uh, to know why that device is there and why they need to leave the device in place to stop those alarms from, from going off and to know that it's there to protect them. And the same is for the staff needs to be re-educated on how to go in and properly adjust those alarms and not adjust them to a point because the patient keeps setting off the alarm and to turn it to a point to where uh, it, it doesn't alarm because, you know, the patient's not being cooperative. Uh, that can lead into trouble in the long run. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I'm aware of situations where alarms have been turned off because they were annoying, and then when the patient condition deteriorated, the, the audible signal was no longer there. They serve a really Correct. important safety function. Yes, and one of the things I'd like to mention is one of the, well, I think it's becoming a standard of, of practice among vendors that they're incorporating um, the uh, a delay, if you will. Uh, we can that, that's adjustable by the staff uh, that they can put up to a 15 second delay on nuisance uh, alarms, meaning that if the patient's scratching or moving, uh, it's not going to immediately alarm like they did in the past. So they have that 15 second delay to allow the patient to scratch and go back to their resting state and have the monitor be able to start reading appropriately again. So my hat's off to the vendors for that. Yes, absolutely. I wanted to conclude our program today by, again, focusing on the combination of pulse oximetry and end tidal CO2 monitoring so we can close the circle. And I know that you touched on it a little bit, but for our listeners, sake, let's just again emphasize why it's important to combine both of those pieces of technology and not rely just on pulse oximeters to detect respiratory depression. Absolutely. The combination of the two allows us to cover, if you will, our bases, uh, meaning that we can monitor the respiratory rate, the heart rate, and in cases of the pulse oximetry, it gives us a better uh, reading, knowing that their perfusion status is good. Um, and what makes things even better today than just a few years ago is, is that the, uh, the end-tidal CO2 uh, device and the pulse oximetry were two separate machines. And so that took up a, a lot of space on a, on a patient's bedside table. Uh, it was additional, you know, uh, cables running out, long cables running all over the place, and that today's uh, devices uh, that we're currently using have the pulse oximetry and the end tidal CO2 devices in one device. They have a built-in algorithm uh, that will let the respiratory therapist or the uh, nurse taking care of that patient uh, gives them 
an advantage of knowing that, hey, something is starting to happen with this patient because these two parameters are not matching the way that they should, you need to come in and evaluate your patient. And so with, because of that, um, we can intervene much quicker uh, for patient safety than we did in the past. So the combination of being able to monitor both oxygen and uh, ventilatory statuses um, is a win-win for the patient. I thank you for your time today, Rick. I know that it's gone by fast for me, and I appreciate your expertise. This program has been generously supported by Medtronic and EarlySense. As a global leader in medical technology services and solutions, Medtronic improves the health and lives of millions of people each year. Medtronic believes its deep clinical, therapeutic, and economic expertise can help address the complex challenges such as rising costs, aging populations, and the burden of chronic disease, which are faced by families and healthcare systems today. But Medtronic can't do it alone. That's why Medtronic is committed to partnering in new ways and developing powerful solutions that deliver better patient outcomes. Our second sponsor is EarlySense. They deliver continuous monitoring solutions designed to enhance proactive patient care for non-ICU general care patients. The EarlySense system provides continuous and contact-free monitoring of heart rate, respiratory rate, and motion for early detection of patient deterioration, fall prevention, and pressure ulcers prevention. Thank you, Rick Kenny, for being part of our program, and please stay tuned for our next podcast.